Oh, so we are in our book of John as we walk through and journey through this year. Um, we're going to go through. We're still in John chapter 2. Um, God is, is so good in the way that he gives messages. He's so good in the way that he plans his messages. Um, and the songs. I say all the time that Jennifer and I do not confer about songs in any way, shape, or form. Um, I don't know what songs we're going to sing until... I'm sitting in my seat and I'm looking at the paper. Um, but where we are in John chapter 2 is where Jesus walked into the temple the first time and cleared the temple. And he clears this temple because they're using it for something that it's not to be used for. But this last song that we sing, I worship you, I worship you. The reason I live is to worship you. The reason why Jesus was so incensed with, or, uh, incensed with all of this and, and um, a righteous anger was building up inside is because what was going on in the temple at that moment was blocking the worship of God. So all of the gospel accounts have a story of Jesus clearing the temple. However, um, like I said, this is the first time Jesus cleared the temple. When we look in Matthew and Mark and Luke, um, we see Jesus clearing the temple near the end of his ministry, um, right before uh, his time at the cross. But here in John, he goes over a clearing of the temple that happens very much in the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It's Passover time. This is the first recorded Passover that Jesus spends with his disciples. Um, and he goes into Jerusalem and he goes up to the temple just as everybody would. And he notices that the temple court is a little more full. Than it, than it usually is. Um, and interestingly enough here, I'm going to go ahead and read the beginning part of this. And it says, It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. So Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. So what Jesus comes upon here is uh, animals, money changers, tables, and people uh, shouting and um, buying and selling and, and a lot of noise. And as I said, the interesting part about this is where they are in the temple is the outer courtyard of the temple. If you've ever seen the diagram of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, that first court you enter into is considered the Gentile area. And that's because if you were a convert to Judaism, even as a Gentile, you were not allowed in the inner sanctum of the temple. That was saved for God's chosen people, Jewish people by birth. And so it's interesting that the first time Jesus clears this temple is not for God's chosen people that were being uh, impeded, but for the Gentiles, us. Those that were not the chosen people. All right? Those that he would save on the cross along with the Jewish people. And I, I found it kind of interesting um, that the first time he does this, it's to make and clear away the place that everyone would be to worship and pray and come before their God. And it, and it alludes to who Jesus came to earth for, for all of us. It wasn't just a special person or a special field or industry that you worked in or a certain uh, class of ec uh, economy or um, a certain race of people. Or It was for everybody. I'll fix that hole in my lip one day. Um, so he goes into this temple. And this grieved Jesus' heart. You're there for Passover. Passover is a very sacred time in the Jewish tradition. And, and I am often um, have asked the questions myself, and I believe me and Pastor have talked about it a little bit, is as Christians, why don't we celebrate Passover? It's not a specific Jewish holiday. We all celebrate the miraculous uh, miracles that happen um, and Moses leading his people out of Egypt. I mean, that is our history as Christians. 
But this sacred time of Passover, and Jesus comes into this, and it's everything it shouldn't be. So I'm going to go through, and I'm going to pull out three points that as I was reading through this and preparing that, the Spirit just laid down upon me um, in the rest of this chapter. And the first one was, as I was coming to, the activities in the temple area were blocking, distracting, distracting, and taking priority over the worship and prayer to God. It became a stumbling block. We're told in the New Testament that um, we are not to become stumbling blocks to our brothers and sisters. And so this market, if you will, that was placed in this temple area, that was becoming a stumbling block to those that were selling, right? They weren't being brought there for good intention, for worshipful intention. They were being brought there because, hey, we have an open stall ready for market. Why don't you come down and sell your sheep? That would be really odd if we went out into the world and invited people to the church so they could come and sell their wares on Saturday night or Sunday morning or, or whenever we're supposed to be worshiping, right? Maybe for a Christmas celebration this year, we have people come in and put a market in the chapel. And one of the things that the problem that the Jewish people had over and over again was they forgot the role of the temple in their lives. In the Old Testament, we were told the temple was the place that God set aside for the Jewish people where the Ark of the Covenant was put in uh, the sacred place because that was the place that resembled and represented God's presence among his people. His presence. So what these people were doing, they were saying, well, we're not going to go and worship you in your presence, but here's some sheep and some cattle and, and some market." They forgot the role of the temple in their lives, that it was representing God's presence among his people. In 1 Corinthians 6.19, it tells us, Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you? Whom you have received from God, you are not your own. So what does that speak to us today? Right? If our bodies are the very temple of the Holy Spirit, have we forgotten the role of the temple for God in our lives? Have we forgotten the role that our body plays? Spiritual body, physical body, emotional body, whatever it is. What are we feeding our bodies in whatever aspect you want to look? I'm not here to to tell you how to eat better or stop doing certain habits. That's not what I'm getting to. But what are we taking in through our eyes? What are we watching? What are we listening to? Who are we listening to? Who are we watching? Who are we letting build a foundation of thought in our head? Is that something that the spirit would want to live in? Or is the spirit maybe finding a clean corner somewhere where he can kind of leave that alone and, and maybe sit on the side so when you finally decide to get your stuff cleaned up, he's got a place to move, right? So in a very real way, the people here are using God's temple as a, as a marketplace. But do we do that today in our, the temple that we have, our body, our mind, our emotions? What do we allow to get stuck to us? What do we carry and bring with us from place to place and into each interaction with people and family and friends? And what is in our temple? Right? What's in our temple? Number two is that the love of money replaced the people's love for God. It says, in the temple area, he saw a merchant selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifice. During this time of Passover, when you would go, uh, the tradition would be you would bring a sacrifice to God for the temple, right? You would bring it with you, right? You would bring that, that spotless lamb that you raised, and you would bring it from your home and, and travel to Jerusalem and bring that with you. 
to, to offer it was your first fruits, right? Much, much the same idea that we have of tithing today, right? Of our first fruits of, of what the Lord blesses us with. So you bring your land, your, spot, your spotless land there, but you get there and they go, oh, sorry, that one's not good enough. You need to buy the ones that we're selling. Then it says people are exchanging foreign money. Some people brought money as an offering. Maybe they didn't raise sheep. Maybe they didn't grow crops. So they brought money to put as an offering at the temple. But it says that they're exchanging this money. So the money you brought with you wasn't good enough now. Now you've got to buy their money for an exchange fee. So everything that they were supposed to be doing for moments of sacrifice, for prayer, for worship, for um, reverence to God in this time of Passover, they're making money off of it. It kind of reminds me of probably all of us have uh, experienced this at the movie theater, right? You bring your own soda, you bring your own candy, you walk into the theater and they go, oh, sorry, got to throw that out. I know they do that because I used to be one of those jerks that need to do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can't bring that in here. But I just bought it. Oh, well, there's a trash can or go bring it back to your car. And then you have them, you know, you go into the movie theater and you get up to the line. You know, you wait through that winding line and you're already running late for the movie. If you're like me, you like to watch the trailers. That's my favorite part of the movies. Um, and you miss those because you're waiting in line. And then you get all the way up to the front and popcorn costs $52 and soda costs 70 bucks. But they have a combo for 45 You can get both with three free, free refills, right? Like, seriously? For soda and popcorn? And they give you a big tub that you're never going to refill. So the refill is really useless. But that's what they're doing here in the temple. That's what they're doing here. They're saying, no, that, that you raised... And you made sure it was pure, and you brought it all the way with you as God told you to do. Sorry. Go put it back in your cart. That money you took, go put it back in your money bag. We'll sell you some. We'll exchange it for you. 1 Timothy 6. Describes the very thing happening within the temple. I'm going to read something. Teach these things. Oh, sorry. All slaves should show full respect for their masters. They will not bring shame on, on the name of God and his teaching. If the masters are believers, there is no excuse for being disrespectful. Those slaves should work all the harder because their efforts are helping other believers who are well loved. Teach these things, Timothy, and encourage everyone to obey them. Some people may contradict our teaching, but these are the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. Anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meaning of words. This stirs up arguments ending in jealousy, division, slander, evil suspicion. These people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt and they have turned their backs on the truth. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. A show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. In verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. A side note to that uh, 10, verse 10 where it says, um, if your translation says many kinds of, uh, or all kinds of evil, the Greek word that is used there for all kinds of is the word pantone. And a more accurate translation of that word would be all evil. I feel like when you say all kinds of evil, you're maybe leaving some types out. But what 
Well, Paul's telling Timothy here, it's all evil. Every bit of it. There isn't an evil that exists that is not rooted in the love of profit and money and material. The world, right? the love of this world, the love of what this world has to offer, and the love of what this world gives us and bears fruit of. The root of all evil lies in the love of, and the desire of that. So does the love, desire, and dependence on money replace our love, desire, and dependence on God? Are we looking to God for our needs? Or are we looking for something that this world can offer? So a litmus test. Does your financial stability come before your time with God? It's a personal, or uh, yeah, that's a personal discussion. That needs to happen with each one of us and the Lord. Right? I, I can't tell you what the answer is for yourself. Um, I don't know everybody's situation. But to many, too many expenses, if too many expenses means that you have to work more work hours, then that forces you to compromise or sacrifice your time with the Lord or your time with um, coming to church and fellowshipping with your brothers and sisters. Or if it takes you and separates you from the Lord just a little. Scripture tells us to be careful of the footholds, right? Not to give the enemy a foothold. And that's what that becomes. It becomes a foothold for the enemy. Not that your intention is to give the enemy a foothold. I'm going to rip the shirt one day. Um, it's not that your intention is to give the enemy a foothold. But it's by our actions and by our choices and decisions that we make that create a foothold for the enemy to take hold of. And that's what we have to be careful of. That's what we have to guard against. So that means, you know what? If the expenses are getting to be too much and you have to work more hours, maybe it's time to think about cutting some expenses. Right? Or maybe you're forced to work certain hours. Well, maybe it's time to have a discussion or a thought about we need to find a different line of work. And it doesn't have to be work, and it doesn't have to be expenses. I think that's just a place we can all land and relate to. But it could be anything in your life that is causing something to separate you from God. Because as we allow ourselves to be isolated, as I spoke on last week, as we allow ourselves to be isolated from God and isolated from our brothers and sisters and isolated from the fellowship and isolated from worship and isolated from prayer and all of a sudden, this Christian walk starts to become a solo thing. And our Christian life is not a solo thing. It is a team sport that we have to be there among each other. You know, no, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But if you are a Christian, you better be at church. Because that's where you have your support. That's where you have your foundation. That's where you have the advice, the godly, scriptural advice. When you go, I don't know what to do. Are you going to call someone that is... In the Word, someone that is led by God, someone that has the Spirit inside them that can give you a helpful word of advice? Or are you turning to someone who's going to tell you what's acceptable to the world? What's acceptable to society? What's acceptable to a culture? Because right? there's a lot of things we can look through in culture that may be full-on acceptable, but it is not welcome in God's house. Right? It's not welcome in heaven. It is not welcome in the presence of the Almighty God. Because it is directly contrary to who and what he is. So where are we keeping our foundations? Are, are we plugging in there? Are we allowing ourselves to be isolated? Is the love and the desire of other things getting in the way as it was for these people that were in the marketplace? Maybe some of them were Jews that were wayward. Maybe some of them were good intentioned, right? And as they say, the road to hell is paved in good intentions. Intentions are great, but at some point they have to go from being an intention to an action. Because if they not, the intention is useless. Right? So that number two one is the love of money. 
overtook the love of God in their hearts. It is what motivated them to set up this marketplace, to sell this stuff, to create a stumbling block and a blockage for people to access the temple so that they can pray and worship um, and, and come alongside their God to remember the moment of Passover. Number three, and this is something that Jesus lands on a lot through scripture, is that the religious leaders authorized and sanctioned this practice. It wasn't happening without them knowing. It's not like they walked up and went, where did this market come from? Although scripture doesn't say it, I'm, I'm think it's fair to say that they were probably getting a kickback on some of these animals sold and some of these fees for exchanging money and I'm sure that they had a little hand under the table. The religious leaders were authorizing this. They were condoning this. They were encouraging this. Ironically, as I, as I was reading through this, did the tax collectors not do the same thing? And yet the religious leaders of the temple wouldn't allow a tax collector through the gate. Yet the religious leaders are doing the same thing the tax collectors are doing, taking advantage of God's people when they're trying to approach his presence. The tax collectors at that time, if you didn't know, could charge whatever they wanted up above the set tax amount that the Romans told them they had to collect. And that's why a lot of times the tax collectors were hated among the Jewish people because they took advantage. And most times those tax collectors were Jews. So they were taking advantage of their own people to line their pockets. The religious leaders, those that are teaching and preaching and watching out for God's flock, are selling a few of the sheep on the side to line their pocket with the wool. They're selling their own people out. In chapter one, we went over uh, John the Baptist. And he had told the religious leaders then that the one that comes after me, the one that will baptize, not with water, but with the spirit, he is among you and you don't even recognize him. And this alludes right to that. No wonder they don't recognize him because they're too busy lining their pockets with the wool of their own sheep instead of in the word trying to figure out when is this Messiah coming and what should we expect? So in doing so that, they lost sight of the role of the Messiah in their lives. So they weren't ready for Jesus of Nazareth. They were looking more for King David, again, who would go out and defeat all their enemies and bring down the Romans. And he was going to come into earth riding on a white horse, decked out in armor. And, and they didn't get that. And that's because they weren't here. They were too busy in the back room counting their money. Even today... The leaders of the church, people that teach the word of God are held accountable for what happens in the church body. And I think this goes right along the lines of today. I'm not going to mention names or groups because I don't think that's necessary or appropriate. But there are some recently that have been in the news. There was one, somebody walked in the front door of his church as he was preaching and robbed him at the pulpit of all of his jewelry. He had over $10,000 worth of jewelry on his body. Now that doesn't mean that you can't spend money on things, you can't have nice things, and that's not where I'm going with this. But are the leaders of the church raising themselves up while their flocks are screaming for help? Are they lining their own pockets with the wool of their own sheep? Or are they out there being the shepherds God calls them to be? In Hebrews 13, it says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority, right? Have confidence, submit to them because 
They keep watch over you as those who must give an account. So yes, everyone is responsible for their own sins. Everyone's responsible for their own way to heaven. Everyone is responsible for themselves. However, these religious leaders will be held accountable for how they taught and led their flocks. Were they teaching and preaching or were they marketeering when they should have been teaching and preaching? Or were they teaching and preaching the wrong thing? Or were they inaccurately teaching and preaching? Were they feeding the right food? Or was the food they were feeding poison? In James 3.1 it says, Not many of you should become teachers. My fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. As I said, people will make their own choices. There is nothing that I as a pastor or any of our elders or any elders in any other church or any of the pastors or reverends or ministers in First Baptist Church of Robbinsville, there's nothing that we can do to just place you in heaven. There's not. I don't have any special words I can give you. Um, I don't have any, I've I've said a couple weeks in a row, there's no special prayer. So you are responsible for yourself. If Jesus himself couldn't get through to everyone he encountered when he was here, there's no chance that we have to do it, right? It is only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can to be led by him and to be obedient. So what he tells us to do and how he tells us to do it and to be obedient to the word of God and how it instructs us to be. We are also accountable for our efforts on one another. And that's why I said earlier that we are not to be stumbling blocks, right? The circle is back to point one. And we can affect each other. We can um, lead each other in, in ways that allows us to slip off or step back or slide. Maybe somebody's watching, right? As, I, as we've talked about our personal testimonies and our encounters, as Rick has shared today, you know, what is God doing in your life this week? Share that with people. Remember, when we share, when we do things, when we act a certain way, there could be people watching. And there is. There's people affected. Now, no one is perfect. And even Christians should never be expected to be perfect all the time, right? Or ever. <laughs> But it's when we make a mistake or we backslide or we fall or we do something that we shouldn't do, are we taking the steps to then make it right? Are we taking the steps to then um, reconcile? Are we taking the steps to restore? Are we taking the steps to say, hey, I was wrong here. I'm sorry. That's the key. That's where it lies. Or are we just stepping away from it? One, are we oblivious to it? Or are we even intentionally not doing that because, well, you know, I don't want to feel bad. I don't want to be awkward. I don't want to get embarrassed. You know, is our pride too here to say, hey, I was wrong? Speaking about people not knowing, or when someone's always watching, <clears throat> Rick and I were talking earlier today about a movie that is on uh, Amazon Prime, if you're interested in watching it. And I believe the name of it was uh, Honk for Jesus. I don't know if anybody's seen this movie or seen the title. I believe that was the title of it. And the beginning of this movie, um, the pa- this pastor is walking down the street. You know, and he's got his nice clothes on. And he's got, you know, these Armani Italian shoes on. And, you know, he goes and he steps in gum. And he goes, ah. Oh. Somebody's recording him. And he goes, oh, you can edit that out. And he goes, no, I can't. No, I can't. But there's that intention. Where was the pastor's intention there? He wanted to edit out his mistake as if it never happened. But that's not what it is to be a Christian. You don't edit out your mistakes. We repent for our mistakes. We ask for forgiveness for our mistakes. We identify and we own up to and we make right the things that we slip or fall or slide back on. Jesus made a whip 
from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and cattle. He scattered the money changer coins over the floor and turned over their tables. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures. Passion for God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign and prove it. All right, Jesus replied. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What? They exclaimed. It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you can rebuild it in three days. But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. There's a couple things there. Again, circling back to the temple, right? Jesus said his body is the temple. He also told us that our bodies are the temple for the Holy Spirit. So what are we doing with our temples? Are we respecting? Are we investing in our temples? What are we investing in for our temples? Are we putting the right things inside? Are we making sure that our temples are in a right place for the Lord? And that doesn't mean perfection. That does not mean perfection. That just means where is our heart, right? Like the religious leaders, like that pastor from that movie, where is our heart? Is our heart in alignment with God? Is our heart in alignment with Christ's teaching? Is our heart in alignment with the example that we're supposed to be of Christ to those around us? Are we being the church an example? The last part of this chapter says, Because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust in him. But Jesus didn't trust them. That's heavy. That's sin. Because he knew human nature. No one needed to tell him what mankind is really like. And that is our nature, right? Our nature is to fill ourselves up, especially in today's day and age and in today's culture, especially with these, with these things, right? You can fill this up with everything the world has to offer, and there are no restrictions. You can access anywhere, anything, anytime, all the time. And there's no stopping you. How, many, how often do we, and, and I'm guilty myself, how often do we sit down, let me check my email. Two hours later, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Let me check my email now. I've been there. I've been there. You get sucked in, right? You get sucked into these devices and we, we pour time and effort into these things. And what do they give us back? Nothing. <laughs> Maybe some, some people say that there's radio waves that come out of these things that help fry your brain. Could be true. Who knows what's in these devices? But we so easily and so quickly put them up to our heads and type on them or throw tablets in front of our children or Jesus says or it says about Jesus that he knew his human nature right he knows our nature if left alone he knows our nature if left without him So what's our weekly focus this week? What in our lives is taking priority over God? Right? I don't think there's anybody in here or out there or sitting in any church tonight or tomorrow that can't say there's something in your life that takes a little more priority. That maybe, you know, you're listening to a sermon on your phone or doing your daily devotion and bing, bing. Do you pause your devotion to see the notification? 
Maybe the phone rings. Oh, that could be important. God will understand. And how often do we go back to what we were doing? Or do we get wrapped up in the phone call or the text message or somebody knocks on the door or a delivery comes, right? Amazon's here. How often do these little things, and we might not even realize or we may not even see that this is taking a priority over our time with God, but it is. It really truly is, right? And how often do we say God will understand? God understands. He knows However, before we're so quick to demand what God will understand, Jesus told a disciple that had said to him, I will follow you anyway. Jesus told him, the Messiah has no place to rest his head. He has no place to live, right? And then another one came and said that, well, I'll follow you. And Jesus said, well, come, follow me. And he said, well, can I bury my parents first? Jesus said, follow me. Let the dead bury the dead. Jesus wasn't insensitive or callous to family matters. That's not what Jesus was saying. What Jesus was saying is, you need to put me first. Even when it's family. Even when it's your job. Even when it's an emergency. Even when, fill in the blank. Put me first. First, give Jesus his time. We talk about tithing as our first fruits, our first money, our first crop, our first animal back in the day, right? But how often do we see our tithing as our first time? So what in our lives is taking priority over God? Is our love, desire, concern, or dependency on materialistic things beginning to or already has? taking priority over the praise that God, or the place that God should have in our lives. Does God truly come first? So let's take, let's take um, inventory of that this week. In our, private, in our private time, in our alone, in our quiet time with the Lord, pray. Ask the Spirit to reveal in you, is there any area in my life, Lord? Maybe you don't know, and that's okay. That's why the Spirit says, I'll reveal it to you. Just ask. Just ask. So let's, let's actively ask the Spirit this week, is there a place in my life that I am not putting God first? Is there a place, an area in, in my lifestyle that God is taking a back seat? Not only reveal it to us, but then enable me, strengthen me, give me the wisdom to put you first, Lord. When we desire to do His will and His work, He responds. Often, as I said earlier, when it's things that are close to the heart, we think God understands. And it may sound harsh, but it truly isn't. The Sabbath was meant as a day of rest, a day to praise God, a day to remember Him, to devote to Him. Are we keeping the Sabbath for God? Are we keeping a moment cut out in our lives for Him?